Welcome to City Inside Out, where we bring you news, information, and opinion about Seattle government. Among the biggies this week, mandatory recycling. Soon you'll be required, yes, required, to recycle all paper products. No more throwing that stuff away. We discuss the hows and whys of this new initiative with the director of Seattle's Solid Waste Programs. And later, a local environmental leader grades the city on its efforts to be green. First, however, a bit of recycling of our own, namely a recap of the major news stories from City Hall this week. Well, it's the season for annual State of Speeches. Last week it was George Bush on the State of the Union. This week, closer to home, it was Mayor Nichols on the State of the City. There was lofty rhetoric, as can be expected, but no major announcements. The mayor's themes this year, economic development and transportation. Just after Greg Nichols spoke, Peter Steinberg rose to give what was the first ever council response to a Seattle mayor's State of the City address. He was determined to send the message that the council is still relevant despite a strong and take charge mayor. This year we will act on fulfilling the dream of a transportation network that is convenient, flexible, and yes, even fun. Seattle in 1962 focused on connecting itself to the world. Now we will make progress on connecting our city to the region and our neighborhoods to one another. Mayor Nichols has put forth his bold agenda for the city of Seattle in 2003. There is much you've heard today that we all agree on, I'm sure. The City Council, Seattle's nine independently elected representatives, believe that it will take cooperation, collaboration, and prudent leadership to guide the city at a time when financial constraints have caused us to make tough choices. Good news for light rail this week, kind of a rarity. The Bush administration included $75 million for the project in its most recent budget to Congress. It's part of Sound Transit's $500 million federal grant request. The recent allocation is a sign that D.C. officials seem to be giving the nod to the light rail project after having been skeptical for the last few years. Buses are fine, but don't take away our parking, so say Aurora Avenue merchants about a plan to remove parking along their street to make way for a bus-only lane. They say it will hurt business. City planners say it's necessary to speed up bus travel. It's a balancing act between competing interests, say council members, including Richard Conlon. What we're trying to do is to balance a very important business community, uh, the desires and needs of our neighborhoods to try and have a main street for their neighborhoods in ways in which it make, becomes more uh, pedestrian friendly and oriented towards the neighborhoods, and also the needs of the region for through traffic, particularly the buses that come through there. My personal recommendation is leave everything the way it is and get rid of the bus lane from 105th North would do the most to serve the community. Taking three lanes of traffic, cutting it down to two lanes in a bus zone is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Hmm. Council members, in an effort to provide more oversight of City Light, have authorized a risk management study. The utility has never done such an analysis. The goal is to get a sense of how much risk City Light is exposed to from energy price increases, fluctuating water levels at dams, etc. Councilmember Junina Castro, however, has her doubts about the value of more study. What I see here are a lot of words, and I don't understand what we're getting out of this. And to talk about consensus, working together, I mean, this is the type of stuff that personally makes me bonkers. When we're talking about the water, it, it, if you could explain to me, Gary, what we're going to get out of this, of how City Light will function better and start being able to save our uh, rate payers money instead of continuing to increase it. I would appreciate that because I don't see what we're getting out of this. What we hope to have as a final product is a well-informed set of policy directions, either confirming the direction that the council has given us in the past or focusing on um, new directions that the utility will carry out. Drowning in paperwork, that's another concern that Judy Nicastro had this week on the subject of City Light. A recent audit strongly recommended that all council members participate more than they already do in utility oversight. Heidi Wills made the case for the additional workload, but Judy Nicastro wondered aloud whether the increased burden made policy sense. We really need to get up to speed as a whole council on this. It's important that all nine 
who are board of directors of City Light are, are at the same level of competence as we determine what are the appropriate policies for risk management and power management as we move forward. And I have a somewhat of a concern of us um, passing so much on to the elected officials, onto all of us, that we are, I feel, pulling away from the department's responsibility to do the analysis, to do the work, and to give us a very condensed version of what is needed. This week, the city rather quietly paid a $225,000 settlement to a former Seattle police officer. She had claimed sexual harassment against three of her colleagues, two of whom, she argued, even broke into her home. Under the terms of the agreement, the city is neither admitting nor denying wrongdoing. A settlement, they say, was preferable to going to trial where the risk of losing more money existed. Here's a new idea at City Hall this week, driving school for government employees. Well, sort of. Turns out workers using city cars have a rather high accident rate. That's prompting lawmakers to do something. Among the enthusiasts for a safe driving program for employees is council member Jan Drago. Indeed, she noted that police have had more than their share of accidents of late, three in one recent weekend. And now on to our neighborhood roundup. Here's what's making news in various corners of Seattle. First stop, White Center. Dog owners didn't get all the new real estate they wanted, though council members agreed this week to expand the off-leash area at West Crest Park. They turned down requests for dogs to roam free in the more wooded areas of the green space. Dog owners were disappointed, and so was Margaret Pageler, but for a different reason. She voted for the proposal, she said, since off-leash dogs in the wooded area would have helped fend off, quote, gangbangers, drug dealers, and sex dealers. A new argument, no doubt, in the ongoing debate over off-leash areas. And now to Seward Park, where birds are talking, quite literally, a flock of wild parrots were recently found in the trees of that southeast area green space. Needless to say, they aren't native to this area. Naturalists theorize the birds probably escaped from various homes where they were pets and most likely found each other from their talking. And finally, this from South Lake Union. Leaders of the group to reno renovate the Kalakala Ferry have raised the white flag. They say they are giving up the fight to find more money and a home for the vintage ship and are instead putting it up for sale. And now on to our City Inside Out calendar. Here are some of the events in the coming weeks that we think are worthy of mentioning. The Parks Department is sponsoring several work parties to help clean up and beautify your favorite green space. These are the dates. Interlochen Park is on February 15th. So is Frink Park and Golden Gardens is that day also. At North Acres Park, the work party is on the 15th and also Green Lake Park on February 19th, and finally Magnuson Park is on the 20th. The following neighborhood meetings are happening in the next few weeks. The Delridge Community Council meets on February 19th. There is a meeting in the Yesler neighborhood about plans for a new community center on the 19th also. In Meadowbrook, they gather on February 20th to discuss reno renovations to the play area there, and the Southeast District Council meets on the 20th as well. And finally, some Black History Month events to pass along. A Youth Day celebration occurs on the 19th. There will be a festival in Soto on the 21st. Finally, an exhibition featuring the works of well-known local artists such as Jacob Lawrence, Barbara Thomas, and James Washington will all be at the Key Tower Gallery now through May. For more information about any of these events, you can check our website at www.seattlechannel.org. And finally today, persistent bioaccumulative toxic chemicals. Say what? Well, I'm not really sure what that means either. It does sound bad though, doesn't it? So bad, in fact, that council members were briefed this week about efforts to eliminate so-called PBTs from various city practices. PBTs include such things as chlordane, toxaphene, endosulfan, and pendimethylin. I doubt we'll miss them. And on that note, we close. But stick with us up next, mandatory recycling. That's the direction Seattle leaders are taking us. Hear why when we talk with the director of Seattle Public Utilities. All that when Inside Out continues in a moment.
we now welcome Chuck Clark. He is the director of Seattle Public Utilities. Thanks for coming in. Well, thank you very much. So mandatory paper recycling and mandatory aluminum recycling and mandatory glass recycling. I think that's a good explanation of it, yes. Uh, is this too big brotherish? Well, we don't think so. Uh, you know, we've taken a look at what's happening with recycling rates and we've looked at what uh, is necessary to really try to get a higher level of recycling. And we're still seeing people put a lot of paper cans and bottles in their in their waste, and we think it's time to start uh, trying to turn that around. I mean, up to now, it's only been a voluntary system. Yes, it has. And what are the why have rates gone down? Well, I think there are a couple reasons that rates have gone down. One is uh, we don't uh, educate as much as we used to, uh, as we were in the 80s and early 90s. And I think the public's getting, uh, was used to all that education, had really had an intention to do the recycling, and as we've not educated as much, they've started to kind of backtrack on their commitment on the recycling side. Has the city really cut back its education programs? Significantly. We're probably educating, spending about a quarter of what we spent back in the 90s on that, because we kind of rested on our laurels, thinking, well, we've educated everybody now, and it's, and we're uh, we've Seattle done, and we're green. and yeah. everybody's committed, so we don't have to do that anymore, and what we're finding is we weren't right. And, and are these uh, flyers and what mailings, what, what, it was, what does education amount to? Well, what we'll do is we'll do a lot of flyers and mailings and press and radio and TV that basically say, uh, here we're going to redouble our efforts on recycling um, and try to get out to as many households as we can. We'll put stuffers in the bills. Uh, so we'll do a whole uh, long year long cycle of trying to provide more education on what we would like to see people do. So now it's mandatory, or it will be, right. once this policy starts getting unfolded, uh, glass, paper, and aluminum, as we said. How cutting edge is this? How many cities in America are, are requiring this? Well, we're probably, we looked uh, at that, and we're around probably 5 to 10 to 15 cities are doing some version of mandatory uh, recycling, mandatory paper removal, bottle removal, can removal. Uh, and they've, they followed that on the heels of what we did uh, originally, which was yard waste removal. Many other cities then went to the next step and started doing other mandatory requirements. I, I guess you have a precedent here with yard waste removal, mm -hmm. which is which is now mandatory. That is right. to say, someone has to put their yard waste in a separate container or else it right. doesn't get picked up. Right. And we, uh, when we originally looked at uh, yard waste, it composed about 17% of, of people's garbage. And after we put the mandatory uh, component uh, in, it's about 2% now. So there's significant reduction in yard waste in the, in the garbage. Meaning real compliance with the... Right. Here's the question everyone has. Mm -hmm. How the heck are you going to go out and enforce me, the rest of the community, for not putting their mm -hmm. Diet Coke cans mm -hmm. in, the, you know, in the typical garbage and paper and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff? It sounds... Well, okay. Well, we're not going to have a garbage police force. Um, so uh, what we're going to end up doing is probably it'll be a three-step program. Um, one is the education, which we just talked about. Secondly, we'll start uh, the second year of the program. We'll, as we pull the lids off the garbage and as we dump the garbage into the trucks, if we see paper and bottle and cans in there, we'll tag the garbage can and just say, you know, in another year, uh, we don't want to see that in the waste stream. And so we'll tag it for a year. And then the third year, when we actually put the requirements in place, uh, what we'll do is we'll open the lid, look in there, and if there's uh, you know, paper, a significant amount of paper and, um, and cans and bottles, we'll just leave the garbage. And so there won't be fines and there's not going to be police running around looking at it. It'll just mean that we won't pick the garbage up and we'll tag it at the same time. The penalty will be uh, your own landfill right. right in your house. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems that the residential side, as I look at the numbers, is pretty good. That is to say our recycling rates for you know, single family homes and the rest. It's the businesses that, that don't do well. Is it, is it fair to, to require this mandatory on the residential side if the businesses are the ones that are really, why aren't they getting the mandatory? Well, the, they're getting the mandatory also on the paper side, but we're also seeing a backsliding on the residential side. So if you look at the rates, it's down about three, four, five percent uh, since 95. So it's continuing to slide basically off the rates, uh, recycling rates that we had in 95. The commercial side's down about 12 or 13 percent, and which is much more significant, and, and we are concerned about that. That's why we're going to uh, be actually ramping in the mandatory portion of the commercial side faster than we will the mandatory side on the residential, where it'll take us three years to do residential. For large commercial users, we'll implement that in 2004. So they got to speed it up. Yes, it'll be speeded up. Why is recycling so great? 
I mean, it costs some money to send trucks around and do this and to give, you know, tubs to everyone. Well, recycling in the long run is, is cost effective. Uh, if you uh, argue that kind of the life cycle costs, when you figure in the costs of disposal, the costs of building new uh, land, uh, land waste sites, um, super fun cleanups and cleanups of landfills, you build all those costs in and what it says is, try to keep stuff out of the waste stream rather than putting stuff in the waste stream. So over the long term, over 20 or 30 years, it is cost effective. Even though in any given year, there is a cost to the right. city. In, in any given year, there is a cost. And when we looked at the cost for this program, it's our assumption that means the rates are going to have to go up about 1 to 1.5% 1 if all the programs are implemented when we go to the city council. Why is it that when you collect paper, aluminum, glass, why isn't it cheaper and therefore good economics to go ahead and sell that and recycle that? It seems like that intuitively is cheaper than, than creating those things from scratch and yet it's not always the case. Well sometimes it is um, and sometimes it depends a lot on what the market is for those products because as we recycle them it means we reprocess them in many instances and resell them. So when the economy is having a problem um, and you don't see as much pressure for the use of recycled goods the market starts getting depressed and so it is not as cost effective. If the economy is running hot and there's a lot of demand for recycled glass and cans and paper then the markets are in better shape. So it just it depends on the time frame. Sometimes it is very cost effective. Um, right now with the depressed uh, market then it's going to be a little bit more expensive to do that. But it's but it's not always cost effective. That is right. to say sometimes it's cheaper to create glass from scratch, aluminum from scratch, and paper from scratch. Uh, yes it can be and again on the short run it, it's more cost effective to do that. On the long run if you start looking at some of the potential costs of that over a 20 or 30 year period it's significant. The other issue is if you look at Seattle's commitment to try to eliminate greenhouse gases uh, a lot of our commitment is based on our ability to keep uh, methane from being produced in landfills. And methane is produced in landfills because you put garbage in landfills. And so if you can keep the garbage from going into landfills, you can actually reduce methane production. And so it's also part of the greenhouse gas program. How much does it cost to just take a truck to a landfill? I mean, what's the, do you, well, you just it, pay a landfill to dump it? Yeah, you'd pay a landfill to dump it, a typical truck, depending upon the landfill. Uh, if you brought a truck to the city's landfill, it costs you about $100 to dump. Uh, the truck, um, a garbage truck. If you go some other places it can run less or more than that depending upon the cost for the landfill. We have a couple more minutes left. Food waste is a part of this program. Stuff that mm. typically people are putting in a disposal. There's, there's a new program that you're implementing to recycle that. Uh, two programs. One, uh, backyard food waste. So we'll have containers available for uh, people who want to do small food waste recycling in their backyard. Uh, and then there's going to be a commercial food waste program. We're going to take uh, and try to build on some of the pilot programs we've seen. Uh, Ray's Boathouse has a great one uh, where they're actually cost effectively um, recycling uh, food waste. And we're going to try to build on that and see what we might be able to well, do. Well, residential, uh, I mean, the first, the first program is really for businesses. Yes, I mean, it supermarkets is. Right. and restaurants that, that, that create food waste. Yes, and we're not going to uh, at least now look at uh, curbside recycling uh, food waste. That's something we're taking a look at, but it's not part of the package we have now. The cynics will say this is Mayor Nichols' attempt to be green and to win over the green people. Uh, cynics can say a lot of things about a lot of people. We think it's just the right thing to do. I mean, why now? There's a question mm -hmm. about if recycling rates have been, been going down. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's two reasons. One, uh, when I started this job a, year, a little over a year ago, one of the first things the mayor said to me was, so, you know, how is recycling going? And when I laid out for him some of the recycling rate uh, direction over the last couple of years, he said, gee, I don't think that's the direction we want to be going. So we went and took a look at everything and came back to him with a whole uh, proposal on how to proceed. The second issue is it is over the long run over 20 or 30 years much more cost effective to be doing recycling than it is to be doing disposal in landfills and so the longer you wait the uh, more expensive it becomes. You want to get to 60 percent recycling rate by 2006. 2008. 2008. Still the goal. Still the goal. Chuck Clark thanks for being here. Thank you very much. You are the director of the Seattle Public Utilities which is in charge of Seattle solid waste programs. Stay with us. Up next, a local environmental leader grades the city on its efforts when City Inside Out continues in a moment.
We now welcome Alan Durning. He is the Executive Director of Northwest Environment Watch. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. So how do you grade the city on its recycling program? Well, the recycling program was, a, was an A-plus in the late 80s when it was first introduced, and uh, I'm glad to see that the mayor has introduced a fairly ambitious proposal for getting our grade back up, but I think we've slipped in the last, in the last few years. We're probably a B-minus right now. Why did we slip? Well, I think a few things happened. Um, the, the, the business sector uh, decreased their vigilance about recycling, particularly paper, and so our recycling rates overall declined. Now, partly that's just economics. The, the resale price for waste paper dropped. But I also think that people just got a little bit sloppy about separating their, st their, their trash. Other things were in the headlines than the environment. I mean, when, when this started, it was the Exxon Valdez, and it was Earth Day 1990, and environment was the big issue. You know, the spotted owls were all over the headlines, and now it's, you know, it's war and terrorism and recession and so on. So it isn't quite as forefront in people's minds. Reduce, reuse, and recycle, the trilogy we hear from mm. folks like you who are leaders in this movement. What's the most important of those? Well, reduction. Recycling is the, the bronze medal winner in the waste management hierarchy. And if we can reduce the, the stuff out of the waste stream in the first place, if we can sell products that aren't as heavily packaged, then we dramatically reduce the environmental costs and also the costs on, on rate payers. I mean, the recycling program is essentially a system in which we pay through our garbage rates to pick up the waste that mostly product manufacturers generate. And we don't have a choice of you know what, what packaging goes on our goods or how durable the goods are in the first place. But um, before we can change the entire system, recycling is an, is an excellent thing to do. It's better to win a medal than not to win one at all. Uh, granted, but is there too much emphasis on recycling? If the, if, if the mm. city put more money into other programs, mm -hmm. like reducing, like reusing, mm -hmm. would, would we get more environmental bang for our buck? I think we would. Um, mostly I want to Mostly I want to praise the, the, uh, the mayor's proposal to expand the recycling program, particularly in t the tough budget times we're in, uh, and to, to set out a program that will get us close to the 60% goal that we first set in 1988. Um, now, if I can quibble with some things, I think there's a little bit too much emphasis on increasing recycling in particular areas and a little bit not enough emphasis on reducing the waste in the first place. Um, we could look at we we could do a lot more outreach uh, to manufacturers and to businesses and and uh, encouraging things like that every office should print on both sides of the page and program their photocopiers to print double sided as the default things like that can over the long term have an enormous benefit for the environment and also just reduce the total amount of stuff going. How the does trash. the city do that? I mean, can the city mandate? Always, it already feels a little bit Big Brotherish to say, yeah. "Hey, folks, you got to all, you know, you got to all recycle your yeah. paper, your glass, yeah. and your and your aluminum." Yeah, and the recycling program in Seattle has been voluntary since day one. It's been voluntary, but with price incentives backing it up. You pay more for the extra trash, but nothing for the recycling. Um, a lot of cities, particularly in the East, have made mandatory have made recycling mandatory from the beginning. Um, so, so for Seattle now in the new plan to make mandatory the recycling of office paper and other paper in businesses uh, may feel like a big step, but it's pretty much in line with what a lot of other places are doing, and we're doing it after a lot of folks are already recycling, so just offer some reinforcement. The city can't mandate waste reduction. It can't mandate that everyone print double-sided or you know print single space instead of double spaced. But um, the city has a lot of has a has a bully pulpit. It can reach out to businesses uh, and encourage them to, to try things. It can give awards to businesses that have done good things. Um, it can uh, ask businesses to make a pledge, and those those programs can really work in a place like Seattle, where people care about their uh, environmental conscience and their image. Recycling is part and parcel of the, the Seattle mystique. How do you score the city on other things it does in, in the environmental category? Mm -hmm. Do we have enough hybrid cars? Are we mm -hmm. conserving That's enough water? That's a really water? interesting question. Uh, I, think this, I give the city very high grades for um, its management of solid waste. The recycling program is pretty good. Uh, water conservation, the city's done well. Management of the watersheds is good. Um, in Electricity, the Seattle-owned Seattle City Light, the municipal utility, does an excellent job. It's really a national leader on energy conservation and, and issues like uh, mitigating emissions of climate changing greenhouse gases. City has tried to do as well in the area of transportation, but probably hasn't done quite as well. And that's an area where I would, I would say we need to focus our attention. Like what? 
Well, you know, if we look to our, to our north, the city of Vancouver, British Columbia, or to our south in Portland, Oregon, you have cities that have done a much better job of concentrating new development inside the city limits and then integrating the transportation infrastructure with that new development. Turns out that uh, the most important things we can do to give people alternatives to the automobile is grow our neighborhoods in a more compact fashion. Um, the sprawl at the edge of the suburbs locks people into their cars. If we can get folks moving into the city, into compact, compact neighborhoods, uh, particularly, um, and this is an area where, where this, this city of Seattle particularly has slipped, is building very dense walkable neighborhoods right around downtown. We're starting to see it around Belltown, uh, but Vancouver, BC has concentrated tremendous amounts of new development and the downtown is extraordinarily vibrant. Fewer than half of trips uh, taken by folks living in those downtown neighborhoods in Vancouver are by car, uh, whereas in the Seattle area you have you know, well over 80% of trips taken I by car. I think you have said that congestion in downtown Vancouver is actually going down. Automobile congestion is going down, yeah. yeah the sidewalks are con getting congested. Yeah. <laughs> it's a European style feeling and that's all about, they have really concentrated development how are we doing downtown core. How are we doing in bike lanes? Not so good. That's a, I'm a biker, so I'm, uh, uh, I have a personal interest in it. But again, if we compare ourselves to cities like Portland, uh, or especially to European cities where the bicycle is treated as an equal, um, uh, an equal competitor with the automobile or walking, our bicycle infrastructure is pathetic. We put in some new ones, it's gradually been getting better. But even look at the, the main north-south bike route from downtown Seattle is on Dexter, and there's parked cars on one side and, and almost no special provision for, for bicycles. And why is that in a city that prides itself on you know being pretty green and pretty friendly? Yeah. Somehow that hasn't come through in transportation? I, I, think that, uh, I think we have a long way to go. What about uh, sidewalks? I guess that's part of the... Yeah, you know, the, the infrastructure for for non-motorized transportation is probably the best investment we can make. Um, you know, we, t we, we fight endlessly over monorail versus more buses versus uh, light rail. But our pedestrian infrastructure, our bicycle infrastructure is radically undercapitalized. We still have a third of residential streets in the city of Seattle that don't have a sidewalk on each block. Um, mostly north end, north of 85th Street. And again, as I mentioned, the bicycling infrastructure is pathetic. Just one more minute here. Do you think people will respond to this recycling message? Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, um, recycling is the, it's the first ritual of our environmentalism. It's the thing, you know, sort of a sacrament. We do our recycling, it makes us feel like we're responsible environmentalists and, you know, Northwesterners. Um, so I, I, I think there's an attachment to it. I think it's harder in the transportation area. People have no relationship with their, with their trash, uh, no, no like love relationship, with yeah, but with their right. car. Yeah. We have they to do. close there. Alan Durning, thank you for being here. Thanks You're for having me. You're the executive director of Northwest Environment Watch. And we thank you all for watching. Join us next week for another edition of City Inside Out. Until then, on behalf of our talented studio crew here, I'm C.R. Douglas. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.